Oh, wow. Thanks for the lively round of applause. That was quite nice to go up to. How are you all doing? My name is Rachel MacArthur and welcome or welcome back to the 13th edition of the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. Um, thank you for joining us this session, which is all about the F word. <laughs> Not that F word, but a few F words. Now, I just actually wanted to know, show of hands, the word feminism, if you find it to be a positive term, raise your hands. Negative? Neutral. Okay. Oh, we've got one. Okay. Let's, let's, see, let's see if you change your mind later on. Um, for this session, we're actually going to talk about feminism in its, you know, pure definition of being the belief in social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. Now, feminism is manifested worldwide and is represented, represented by various institutions committed to activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. It's about working together, not against one another. Now, there is obviously debate on how it's somewhat been turned into a negative word rather than uniting men and women, for example. It's created an even bigger gap, but we're here for the positives and looking at women who are doing extremely well in two traditionally male-dominated fields. So, our first guest, who are very shy, <laughs> I'd love to uh, welcome our first guest, Hafsa. Now, Hafsa Lodi is an American journalist who has covered fashion in the Middle East for the past decade. She's a fellow journalist. Her book is Modesty, a Fashion Paradox, and it's been described as a well-researched and tender portrait of the politics and people behind a movement. So, welcome, Hafsa. Thank you. Thank you. And our second guest, Hori Al Tahiri, is an Emirati sports person, FIFA coach, and instructor, and businesswoman to add to that, and she's currently head coach for the UAE women's national football team, which is huge. Her book, Becoming a Legend, tells the story of how she contended with both a traditional culture and a male-dominated sport in pursuing her dreams. Welcome. <laughs> oh, God, I'm being put in the middle. Okay, 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 cool. So, guys, how's it going? How's it going? Good? good, good. All good? All right, so, first of all, your, I mean, your books are amazing. Now, the first one here is Modesty, Fashion Paradox. That's, that's Mariah Idrisi on the cover, who's a famous um, influencer, yes. modest fashion influencer. And then Hreya, Becoming a Legend, which is very, very insightful. I, love, I loved it. Love both mm -hmm. books, actually. So be, be sure to pick up your uh, own copies. So I'm actually going to start this off with just, I want to know a little bit more about your backgrounds in terms of how did you get into your industry? I mean, I know you from when you were like this high. Um, so maybe perhaps let's start with you, Horea. Like, what, what got you into football? What actually, what was the attractor at the very beginning? Um, at, the, at the beginning, uh, I think football, it's a very, it's a famous game. It's uh, challenging, excited, and there is a lot of rejection for women to be a football player. So for me, it was a, uh, truly, I, I was just thinking, why we, why we, I can't play football? So w w where is the difficult? Uh, why we cannot do this? And I saw a lot of boys are playing, and honestly, I didn't find any difficulties in my uh, with my parents. They've been accepted, but I never saw a woman or a girl playing football. So that was something that I was thinking, uh, why no one can play? So I want to be the first one who playing football. I want to be a different person. So that, mm. that was the first step. And you obviously went into such a kind of strange territory because, you know, in the intro of your book, you said, when I started playing football, there was only one club I could play at. There weren't even enough players to play a real 11-a-side game. There were barely any other Emirati women footballers. So we weren't even able to have a national team. And now there's about 2,300 female Emirati football players. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Now, modest fashion, what got you into it? Well, it began years ago as a teen living in the United States, um, kind of abiding by a modest fashion dress code, but not really seeing any fashionable modest wear in mainstream stores. Um, modest fashion was not a term back then, 15 years ago, and modest wear was not stylish or fashionable. So um, in the past decade or so, when modesty began, be, began kind of rising the ranks um, 
in fashion, it really fascinated me. And um, it, was, it was really long overdue. And it, I was personally invested in reporting on this movement as a journalist. And it led to the book. Yeah, I mean, this is a fascinating insight because having reported on it myself as well, it's kind of the last five years that's kind of really taken hold. And, you know, you, you did write here that the modest fashion movement has indeed enjoyed astronomical growth over the past five years. It began with a niche kind of under the radar and faith-led la labels and businesses uh, to mainstream international fashion houses and finally cementing itself as a widespread retail norm. So in 2019, searches for modest fashion on Pinterest increased by 500%. Yeah, and, and just for the first quarter of the year. Just the first quarter? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, when, you, when you, you were growing up in the West, and obviously when you do have kind of two cultures or maybe like a religion that's, you, you know, when you're growing up in that environment, um, was, was part of it you wanting as well to write something for girls who are growing up now and who could find teenage life a little bit more relatable? Yes. Definitely. I mean, growing up then, when, when you look at modest wear, it was kind of either ethnic wear or oversized men's clothing or wearing your jeans and your turtleneck and your t-shirt on top of that and not really looking stylish, even though today wearing your turtleneck under anything is stylish. So um, it was really kind of to show uh, young women that, that there are so many role models out there. There's so many influencers making you know positive change on Instagram and really showcasing that you can have fashion and faith. You can have the best of both world, worlds. They can coexist. Um, and yeah, you can, you can just have both and you don't have to be one or the other. Yeah. Now, Horea, um, we, we, we heard from Hafsa as in what motivated her to release the book. What motivated you to releasing um, Becoming a Legend? Actually, uh, I've been invited to one uh, event where the, which they've been publishing a book there. And I saw how they trying to deliver the message uh, over the world. And uh, there was the beginning. I, I knew that I have a message. I was lucky to meet Kira from the collective, uh, Dream Collective. Mm -hmm. And I had a discussion with her regarding uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my story. And uh, it, it wasn't my story, actually. It's about how women can be in a region the best, but no one knows about them. Because when I've been talking about what we achieved, people been asking me uh, where, when, because they staying in UA, but they never knew that there is a woman and uh, uh, Emirati girls actually doing this. So here I knew that it's my job to uh, try to uh, send the message over the world and tell them that all the, uh, uh, women in the region can be a champion as well. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's certainly, it's it's come a long way. And, you know, even going back to your book, it's quite funny, like, not funny, funny, but it's the struggles that you've had because there is a common misconception that as an Emirati, you have unlimited access to funds. Whereas in your book, you were saying your first job, the club was paying you a salary of 3,000 dirhams and you were trying to kind of get a club together and then your first even your first job as an extra was 6,000 dirhams so there is also that misconception that oh yeah you're Emirati we can do anything for you but you actually fought quite a big battle didn't you yes uh, you can get uh, it, it depends on the, your objective your personal objective if, if you're looking for a salary high salary it's easy just go to the normal job and get the high position uh, you have your certificate, education, so you can get this. But if you want to be a different, there is a different road as well. So it's a choice always. What do you want to be? And do you want to be, uh, there is a, a easy way and there is a hard way and there is a lot of uh, sacrifice as well. You need to, to be accepting this. So when I choose to start, uh, I knew that I will be in a good position one day and I knew I will get the high salary but not today, it wasn't the right time. <laughs> but by putting an effort, uh, uh, I'm gonna get it, but in a long term. I just wanted to spend uh, uh, more uh, effort in myself to be the best with the knowledge and experience. Uh, that's why I was ready to sacrifice a lot of things. Mm. Were, were there any roadblocks initially in your way? I mean, I know you've written that you've ha you have a supportive family, but was there at any point where they said, listen, can you just do a normal high-paying job? 
Yeah, they supported me because they accepted the idea that women can also do a sport. This is, that's why I say always, I'm a lucky that my family and or my parents, they always been supported me. But do they see what I've been seeing? Do, that, do they believe that I gonna be one day a UAE woman head coach? They never saw this because what they saw in their uh, childhood or what they seeing in a culture that women supposed to stay at home and this is a, just a period of time in school what you can do whatever you do and that's it it will one day she gonna understand and she will do whatever people are doing but they never stopped me they never reject my ideas but they as I, I I understand because of what they've been seeing in their uh, life and their uh, what culture is giving them, what messages are uh, in public they they getting from people. So uh, there is a lot of difficulties been there, mm. honestly, because ac my parents accepting that I can do sport, but I never uh, had a people playing with me, especially women. There is no teams, no clubs. Uh, so in the end, you end up that you're doing this alone, either you do with boys or stay at home. So this is, was the main difficulties because uh, at that age, I cannot create a team and, uh, and clubs and I just need to create an opportunity that I could do what I love. And that was your drive, just kind of seeing the future that you wanted to achieve a certain thing. That's what kept you going. I never knew that I gonna create a team or uh, I gonna be doing coaching, end up coaching or in a FIFA, but I just knew one thing that I want to be, uh, I want to change uh, the future of sports for female, for women especially. I want to have a national team. I want to play in a professional level. And by doing things alone, I can't get there. I just try to support my friends, talking to my friends, talking to my uh, friend parents as well sometimes. It's not my job, but I was trying to just motivate them. And uh, going everywhere, uh, representing women, playing in the park and public, beach, talking to people. I was, I was a kid, but I just been doing this because I just love the game. And I think this was the beginning, which is uh, life guided me like by being through a, a lot of uh, situations, uh, rejections. Uh, and this is, we end up uh, <laughs> doing uh, coaching and uh, I'm really happy that we have a lot of women now. Mm. They are representing a sport in the best way. That's amazing. And, and there, was a, there was a bit in the book when you were talking about how when you went into goal, you couldn't, um, they didn't have your kits because they only had the kits for the main players, but as a goalkeeper, you didn't have the gloves or anything like that. And this is the thing you might think is a bit strange that we're fusing football with fashion, but actually, you know, in female um, f football, especially in the Middle East, there is a lot of still talk about modesty and, you know, different, um, you know, we've got Zara Lari, who's the hijabi ice skater, for example, and that's still seen as kind of weird um, in other places. Now, you've obviously written about this, and Nike famously did a campaign with Middle Eastern Muslim women um, showing, showcasing their modest fashion range. Now, how do you actually define modest fashion? I mean, if you ask... Because uh, it's a paradox. People, exactly. <laughs> everyone has a different um, definition of modest fashion. But from a kind of mainstream, broad perspective, I define modest fashion as clothing that covers the shoulders, um, often up to the wrists, covers the knees, often up to the ankles, is loose-fitting, is not see-through, and has a high-ish neckline. Hmm. Now and we, may include a head covering as well. Of yeah, it could... Yeah. yeah but not necessarily, yeah. yeah. And we did actually ha have a chat about this, that we don't actually know who actually came up with that definition, modest fashion. It kind of just emerged, um, especially over the, the last five years. Um, and obviously, you know, given the title of your book, you know, Paradox, um, is, is modest fashion a contradiction? Because th there is that whole debate of, you need to be, you know, Yeah, it depends on how you look at modesty and what your motivations and intentions are when you're, when you're dressing. I mean, a lot of cultural um, conservative criticisms of modest fashion are that fashion is just to blend in and fashion is to not, you know, attract any unwanted attention. So you should um, just, you know, cover yourself completely and not stand out. 
But it's really interesting because when I interviewed a few different women for this book, they all gave kind of different definitions of what standing out means. So one, um, a hijabi model in New York said, if I wear an abaya here, I'm going to stand out. But if I wear jeans and a loose fitting tunic, I'm not going to stand out. And in um, West Africa, modest fashion may be really bold uh, printed garments that cover yourself that are loose fitting, but are bright and eye catching to, you know, from our perspective. So it was interesting. It's very culturally um, relative. Quite dividing as well, yeah. judging by uh, the number of influences that we have now with it. Um, I, there's, there was an interesting stat that you ran off uh, the back of a report, and it said in 2015, Muslim consumers worldwide spent around 243,000, sorry, 2000, 243 billion dollars on clothing, with around 18% on modest fashion. Now, by the end of 2021, it's estimated it will reach 368 billion in total, a 51% increase. Now, pandemic aside, I mean, this report was done prior to the pandemic, but do you, has shopping actually, has it increased over the past year? Did the pandemic make us shop more? Yeah, I, I actually have an updated um, stat. By the end of 2024, modest fashion will reach uh, $402 billion, despite the pandemic. So um, actually, the pandemic has been really good for the modest fashion movement because one of the underlying um, criteria of modest fashion is the comfort that it provides women. Um, it's comfortable. You don't have to, you know, be too uh, like aware of like a, something that's too tight or something that's too revealing, and you can just you know, be comfortable in loose garments. And obviously work from home lifestyle has really reprioritized comfort for all of us. We're all looking at athleisure and loungewear. And um, so definitely that comfort aspect, whether or not you realize you're subscribing to modest fashion, it's kind of, um, it's kind of really uh, inspired how we shop. So definitely linked to modesty. Yeah, I mean, it, it is that, that is that misconception sometimes that modest fashion is exclusively for Muslim women. But at the end of the day, if something is... You know, yes, within and that also category. that modest fashion is glamorous. It's not always mm -hmm. glamorous. Yes, there's um, there's there are modest uh, evening wear and gowns, but a lot of modest fashion is just how you wear your regular clothes out on a day-to-day -day basis and how you layer and experiment. And I think we did. We all did loungewear over this year, didn't we? I mean, lots of banana bread to cover up, quite frankly. <laughs> so the the f fashion side, when it comes to football. Um, I mean, football kits are tend to be relatively okay compared to other sports, for example, like gymnastics. Um, do, did, do you, did you guys face any problems from any associations with regards to, oh, you can't wear this or you can't wear that or it's too long or? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not because it's about culture. Mm. It's, re it's related to the culture and the uh, judgment so everyone wants uh, to support women sport and women football to grow and to continue uh, girls continue playing football. So they need to avoid uh, the the negative side and judgment from uh, the public people. So what we do actually in national team, for example, everyone should play the uh, the, the under short the stretch, so that we avoid any negative messages and. And I think it's it's and and uh, it's 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 better it's better for them as a player when they play and when they slide and when they defense and you know, but why we started doing this because of uh, negative messages that been uh, we've been receiving through people. So uh, we just want to avoid any uh, negative messages and we want to give opportunity for girls to stay uh, to, to continue playing football. And we don't want anything to stop them. So this is, was the first uh, purpose of uh, that rules. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned negative uh, messages, I, I remembered actually there was an incident in December to do with the Egyptian national uh, women's football team who were playing a, a game against Lebanon. And basically they were trolled online, like the, the number of sexist messages they received just because they're girls. Um, how do you guys deal with trolling or, you know, the criticism that's not necessary? Like, how do you just kind of forget it or does it actually affect um, you getting funding for the team or anything like that? Uh, actually, I don't, uh, we, we, we are lucky because we're not really uh, receiving a lot of uh, negative messages. The only message you can always receive is girls supposed to stay at k uh, kitchen. That's it. 
<laughs> you cannot that play awful. football. That's it. So we're not really, and, and they're doing in the, in the official uh, websites. They're just putting the message and that's it. They're not sending directly to the girls. And I think if they are sending directly to the girls, in future you need to grow and you need to just overcome all of this and you represent yourself and be uh, really uh, um, uh, confident that you're doing the right things and sh you need to show everyone that you're doing the right things. And definitely one day they're gonna believe in this. Mm by getting a lot of achievement and representing the country. And I think uh, it's just a matter of the time. Is it is it a large percentage or a low percentage? Because like for me, as someone who lives in the UAE and comparing it to other countries in the Middle East, the UAE is very open and is very supportive of women you know, being employed. And at the Emirates Mars mission, for example, is 80% women, I think. So, I mean, how much how much of this you should be in the kitchen? <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's uh, when I started, it was uh, something new for them. So I, 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 I never received, but I've been reading a lot of things that people, people sending like, why are women supposed to play? It's a man game. They need to just to stay at home. They need to get married. They, if she play football, she cannot marry. But nowadays, uh, actually with all the support of the government and uh, the highness for women's sports and uh, not just in the sport and in different uh, as, uh, aspect and organizations. So uh, the messages are less, people are really supporting, people are showing and com coming to the game. And by seeing women are playing, they changed because uh, women pr uh, proved that they can play. And some girls are playing against the boys, mixed games. So now they know that or she can pass the ball, she can play, and then they are happier when they have women in the team because it's challenging. <laughs> so um, in, in terms of, you know, so I, I, was fusing, I love fusing fashion with football. It's really, really fun for me. Now, in terms of trolling, <laughs> let's talk about a bit of criticism in the modest fashion industry. What have been the downsides to it? And trolling is a huge, um, unfortunate side effect of this uh, modest fashion movement, especially when you bring religion into the sphere. And many, um, many modest fashion bloggers are what we call visibly Muslim, meaning they wear the hijab. And a lot of very conservative community members believe that wearing the hijab, you shouldn't be in the spotlight. You should just stay at home, get married, be in the kitchen, exactly what, <laughs> what Ria said. So it's, they've had to deal with a lot of um, criticism and trolling. Uh, there's this joke amongst them called like the haram ankles. If your ankles are showing underneath your skirt, someone will point out, oh, haram, your ankles are showing. So it's this whole thing, the haram police, who are basically these uh, fashion police, mainly men oftentimes, just sitting behind their computer screens or phone screens and just um, saying, you know, this is haram, you don't look like a Muslim, uh, dress properly, cover yourself. And a lot of times they try and package it as this re religious advice that we're helping you, sister, but it's very um, derogatory oftentimes. Yeah. And so that's been a, a really negative um, a thing for a lot of these, these modest fashion personalities, especially when their own um, approaches to modest fashion change. For instance, if they remove the headscarf that they once wore, or if they, you know, start showing maybe more skin or maybe wear something more fitted than what they're normally accustomed to, everything is just kind of um, scrutinized because they're on this public platform. Mm. Now, it, it's easy to think that fashion is quite female, for, like it's female led. But you, you mentioned in the book that it's actually a male-dominated industry, and this is where the whole feminism thing comes. We come back to that. Now, even with the trolling, a lot of it does seem to tend to be men for some reason, but you know that they're, they're a unique category of their own, those kind of haram police, as we call them. Um, but, I mean, do, do, do women face difficulties in kind of making a name for themselves in this industry? I think the, the fashion industry as it has, it's typically been dominated by men, male designers, male photographers who have been um, creating and marketing clothing for the male gaze, you know, targeting what will make look, women look more attractive. And oftentimes that means bearing more skin and showing her body more. And so women reasserting themselves in these powerful positions in fashion um, has really focused on the female gaze and the female priorities and what's comfortable and what 
women are confident wearing. So I think it's it's definitely um, it's allowing more opportunities for women in these fields. Just not just designers. I mean, a lot of these, especially hijabi fashion models, are only comfortable with working with all female crews. So female stylists, female photographers. Um, you know, who can go and fix fix something, touch touch their makeup up or something, and they they feel comfortable with that physical contact, which they may not feel comfortable with um, if there were men on set. So the industry is definitely allowing for, for more expansion in this kind of respect. There are now Muslim modeling agencies um, in New York and in London, which is amazing. And they really have these, these new contracts for models that stipulate, I need a private changing room because, of course, on runway shows, you often just change backstage in full view of everybody. So they have these stipulations that are kind of um, catering to their needs. Mm -hmm. And the thing is as well, it's it's not just you know with with Muslim women because there are there have been a surge in influencers who are um, let's say conservative or conservative Christian or some who have kind of embraced this this uh, movement yeah, as well. Of course, from this region we see the Muslims, but actually, if you're in the states, the Mormon fashion community, the Apostolic Christian fashion community, the Jewish women, they're all really. Um, uh, making names for themselves in modest fashion. And actually, they've been doing it for years, uh, way before this modest fashion movement um, occurred. They've been catering to their demographics uh, for decades. So it's really, the movement may have these predominantly Muslim, predominantly hijabi faces driving it internationally, but it really is helping um, and influencing and inspiring women of all faiths. And none. A lot of non-religious women are really attracted to these ideals of modest fashion. Yeah. And when it comes to the international market, I mean, are, do designers really care about Muslim women or is it just like, hey, dollar signs? I mean, like any business, I think it's the dollar signs that, <laughs> that motivate them. But it's the fact that they're taking these steps to recognize these demographics is something. So I don't necessarily see it as a negative. Um, we can't, I don't think we can expect every business to really um, cater to our each and every need. But as long as they're representing us and as long as they're designing for us. I think that's a big improvement. Mm -hmm. Horea, now talking about the male male industry, obviously football is a massively uh, male-dominated industry more than fashion. I, I think we'll agree on that, right? Um, and you've one of the quotes in your book was, I've often been the only woman on my coaching team. I've definitely felt that I've had to work harder to prove myself than a man would. Now, in terms with your setbacks, how do, how do you deal with that? I don't think I could handle it, to be honest, trying to prove myself day in, day out. I mean, what, what's, what's the kind of thing that you encountered? Um, what was happening with you? What, uh, actually, I've been doing uh, coaching courses to become a female coach uh, officially. So I need to go through a lot of courses. And the courses that I need to do it, it's not specified for a woman. It's just open courses. And then... Uh, I've been the only woman who been one of the uh, coaches. So being uh, around a lot of coaches and uh, ex-players, national team players, top level players, men and uh, Emirati, and uh, I've been one of the youngest uh, coaches there, uh, been fun of them, <laughs> actually. So it was really hard because I need to prove myself in a different way, not just because I want them to accept me, Accepting me, it's by respecting me. Respecting me, it's by, I show them how, no, how many knowledge I have. And I just need to prove that I'm doing the right things. I understand what actually I'm saying. When it comes to, uh, about football, it's about rules and uh, some rules in football. And you need to understand the technical rules. You need to understand when you talk about the system of football, about the formation of football. It takes really a lot to study this and to watch a lot of games and to sit with a lot of good people and ask them because I want to grow in this area. And it's hard because it's, you really need to be confident and you really need to work on your knowledge. Whenever you work on your knowledge and uh, you just uh, say the right things and uh, prove that you understand what you're talking about, what you're working on, everyone will respect you mm -hmm. and they accept. By respecting you, they will accept you. And then by time, I get a lot of men beside me saying that I want my daughter to play. Um, 
do you have for this age? Do you have team for this? Where do you play? And they, that mean I've been succeeding by being there. They never told me that, oh, you're good. They never told me that we respect you, but I can feel this by talking to me and sending their uh, daughters. So this is was the, the, main, uh, the main point. And this is what I say to everyone, to all the women. Don't spend time just thinking about people, what they think about you, and just keep uh, uh, nagging and just keep uh, saying like, oh, they don't like me because I'm a woman. I cannot reach there because I'm a woman. I, <laughs> yes. And this is, you're representing women in a, in a bad way by doing this. I think you need to spend time on yourself and your career and develop yourself in all areas that you want to be uh, uh, out there and just show everyone that you know, that you understand, that you can achieve. And when you achieve, everyone will stand there and just be beside you, man, woman, everyone. So this is the job that you do. You spend time on yourself. And, and taking that to feminism, you've said in your book, men and women need to work together and men should be encouraged to support women's causes, not just in football, but every area of life. So what do you have to say to parents or fathers who are happy to have their daughters play football at school, for example, but then nothing, nothing beyond that? What, what advice would you have? Um, I faced that, actually, because when I say my parents supported me, I had my brother playing, brothers playing with me in, in the house. And uh, when my brothers start playing, started playing with me, then my neighbors started playing with me. So, because I had my brothers in my back, other boys, they've been accepting me. Because my father was there, and he was facing everyone and saying, yes, my daughter can play. So, no one judged me, no one sent me a negative messages. So, here I knew that we really need men beside us. And they are one of the reasons that women can succeed and even men, when they succeed, they need women beside them. What are you going to say to the parents? Uh, so if it's just, as in, just in school, after school, let her sit at home. Don't let her work. We go to the school study because we want to go to the university, then we want to work. Yes, it's, it's really clear. It's the same with the sport. Everything starts in the school then she needs to take the passion that she has to the different level. She cannot just stay at school doing things and just you kill her passion and stay. It's the same with the study and uh, with the opportunity to, to go to, to get a job and good position. It's similar. A sport, uh, a job, career, it's all the same. It's a passion. Just let her do her passion or let your son do his passion. Well, is there um, is enough being done in, at schools at the moment, at UAE schools, uh, in terms of supporting uh, women and uh, girls in sports? Because, I mean, I remember back in my day, physical education, it was the more important was going to the boys. To be fair, the boys had the more fun sports like football and we were just given really crappy ones. But, I mean, is, is, is there, is there an, is, are we doing enough right now in the UAE? Uh, I think uh, they're trying their best to develop uh, the physical education. Uh, there is a, a lot of different system now happening. Uh, they even got, uh, um, I think it's a technical director they have in the school and, uh, in terms of sports, and they bring it from uh, British to get their experience mm -hmm. and uh, educating other uh, teachers in the section. But I think it's still... We need to really work hard. Uh, we see that. We, we keep saying that. They're doing a great session for boys. They're not doing a great session for the boys. Boys are good players <laughs> since they born because they had the all opportunity to play everywhere. And then in the sports session, even if the teacher is doing nothing, he's going to play and you're going to see a nice game there. Women, they need more time and effort because they've never been through this. It's just different of the level. Yeah. And then we need the right people to work with us. And you mentioned also the importance of having female kind of role models and coaches because you wrote about a player called Nuf Alanzi, Anzi, Nuf yes. Alanzi, who 
she wasn't really allowed, but it's when you were involved, the mother really trusted you. And she said, as long as she's with you. Is that By the way, Nov is here. Oh, is she? Oh, hey. <laughs> so, yeah. So, sorry, are we allowed to talk about this? Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, she, you took her under your wing because she, she started out football early. Yeah, Nov was uh, one of the players who were very shy and she started very young in the team. And... Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, she's uh, like her parents are very open minded, mm. but they want a safe area for their daughters and a good training session and a lot of things. They were very close working. Uh, they've been always in the training beside her, asking her. So I, I saw the girl and I saw and uh, her sister is player as well. Anud. <laughs> they are both our national team players. So. These two girls are uh, really motivated. Uh, Anud was busy with the school and then she went to the university, but North State coming to each training and when, even when she had an exam. So I knew that she wanted to reach to a different level. And that was my dream one day. I couldn't do the dream to myself because I became a coach, so I didn't continue playing football. And I thought this is the time to just uh, reach to my dream through a different person. So North gave me all her uh, time and passion and love of the game. And that helped me to work with her. And for the first, uh, she became the first professional player. Uh, she played in Egypt for a year. And she's the first Emirati to play uh, as a professional player. Well done. <laughs> Shame I won't be able to recognize you in the, <laughs> the mask. <laughs> That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, Hafsa, did you did you ever want to get into football? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you only watch football because of your hubby. Is that it? Yes. Sir. <laughs> I actually went to a football camp when I was uh, very young, but it, it didn't turn out well. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the book is kind of a stepping stone because you've started out your own thing now, and you're doing styling. So you never know. There could be a collaboration <laughs> here in the future. And yes, what, maybe actually. What is it? I, I take my commission right now. Um, <laughs> what is it that you? What, what is it that you're doing, and yes. you're hoping to achieve beyond the book now? So when the book was printed and published, the modest fashion movement kind of kept growing and kept expanding, kept developing. A lot of new designers were coming on the scene. A lot of you know some of the pioneering uh, influencers were changing their views about modesty. The main um, hijabi model who kind of spearheaded the modest fashion movement in the West, Halima Aden recently quit mainstream modesting, mo modest modeling because she said that the international industry didn't really respect her hijab. So a lot of these, um, these developments kept taking place and she said that one of the, the main reasons that um, she had maybe negative experiences in her work in modeling was that there was a lack of Muslim stylists or lack of um, modesty conscious stylists who knew how to work with these women. So um, after the book was, was published last year, in the middle of lockdown, um, started working on a plan for a website called Modest-ish. So Modest-ish, because modest fashion is not black and white, it has diverse um, interpretations, many definitions, and many different approaches. So it's this um, content hub that appeals to, attracts all modest fashion followers, any woman interested in modest fashion in whatever shape or color or cut that might take. So it is, it, we officially launched it last week with a collaboration shoot with Puma. We styled their latest international game collection um, in a modest-ish way. So we had one hijabi model, one non-hijabi model. We actually shot around this building. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can check it on, it's on Instagram at modest.ish. And we aim to um, kind of provide these styling services for international brands and designers looking to enter the modest fashion market, looking to make, um, you know, do regional shoots. And they just may not have that awareness or that expertise in how to target this demographic. Yeah. And having seen some of the images, I, I mean, I love the fact, obviously, you're a journalist and you've done your research. You know this industry in, inside out and the images are amazing. But at the same time, it's nice to, to have somebody involved that has an eye and knows what you know brands are looking for and whatnot. So modest and, and uh, Instagram modest.ish, right? Modest.ish and modestish.com. So be sure, be sure to follow <laughs> them and uh, check them out. So, I mean, you set this up last year. Last year, yeah? 
2020. Um, it started as a little uh, fledging vlog last <laughs> last year, but no, properly in the in the last month or so, um, with the help of local creative content agency, digital um, creative agency Broomstick. So we partnered yeah. together. They have all of that manpower that I <laughs> that I need yeah. to really get this going and making it uh, bigger. Getting all of that uh, videography and photography production. Um, and having all that support on on the online, but uh, you were planning it last year. Yeah, started I, planning I it last year. Sorry, yeah, I should have been clear. <laughs> but so, I mean, last year, given the pandemic and yes. stuff, I'm just curious to know. I mean, as a writer, I, we were dealing. I was doing a lot of health journalism, and I was dealing with COVID, and it was like it's intense. Um, as a fashion journalist, and who who was in the process of setting up their own venture. How did you overcome roadblocks? Because we've all been there. Um, for me, when I have a writing block, I turn to reading. And okay. then when I'm sick of reading, <laughs> I turn back to writing. Um, and oftentimes just changing your scenery, going outside, which is very tough in this part of the world, but thankfully right now the weather allows for it. So having that time with nature, um, that really helps overcome it. And as a freelance Journalists, you're always kind of caught up in this cycle of pitch stories and then get those uh, pitches accepted and then write the stories and you're just constantly churning out content and there's no kind of break. So I think it's really important um, for any entrepreneur, for any um, creative to have that, uh, that rest and that relaxation period where they can recuperate and re-energize and refuel that creative passion. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm going to throw it out for questions very shortly. Um, just one more question, Horea. Now, you mentioned that one of your biggest goals is to see the UAE host a major international women's tournament. Um, I mean, what would having something like that create change in this country? And like how, when you face kind of those roadblocks, so obviously sports did slow down last year. When you're suffering those roadblocks, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with the challenges? I think by hosting a, a tournament, an uh, international tournament, it's, it will change a lot of things. A number of participants, uh, people will know a lot because, you know, uh, especially for women, there is no media in sports. It's, it's very less, uh, you cannot see girls playing a game and they just, uh, you cannot see the games on the TV. So I think by having this international uh, event uh, and uh, media support, people will know more about women who are playing. Yeah. They can g come and watch the game. Uh, they will understand. And they, it's, it's about to change the mentality and acceptance. And I think we should work on this kind of uh, um, promotions, uh, hosting events, media plans. So we support the women's game. Uh, in UAE. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, and during the uh, pandemic, we really slow the, the development of sports. But uh, what I saw, honestly, I've been uh, following a lot of girls in uh, social media, not just in UAE, uh, over the world. I really saw them different, uh, different mentality of a sports uh, woman and normal person in general, because uh, they never give up. They've been doing, it's been really, it's been one year. She's been training every day. Even the men's, like I've been following even the athletes. They've been training every day. They've been training twice a day. They've been really active, uh, very positive. And you can see their messages, their picture. They've been doing a lot of different prom promotion through the social media to support uh, other athletes, to support people, to su support safety. They've been, they've been the main pe people who've been working to uh, send the messages around the world that uh, this time you're supposed to do this, you can do. So they, their, their role was very high. Even if there is no uh, any game to, to be playing, it's not just about being athletes. That's, uh, it's not about just playing uh, your sports. There is a lot of things to be done. So I saw this and I was really happy because uh, even the girls uh, in UAE, they've been following a lot of other girls. So this will help them grow their mentality and they will try to do a lot of things by themselves, not just waiting for the doors to open or the opportunity from the uh, uh, entities or organization. If there is no club, so I will stay at home. It could happen one day. Yeah. It could happen. So this time you will be ready, you know what to do next. 
to basically find your tribe, find the people you connect with. Yes. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? We've got two mic. No, we've got no. Yeah, we've got two mics now. Obviously, being being you know spaced out seating and given current circumstances, I'll just ask uh, if you are interested in asking a question, just to stand either here or there. Do, do any any hands hands? Have we covered? Every, I can't honestly. I can't see with this light right in front of me. So, if there's anyone, uh, lovely volunteers will go around as well. Oh yes, hello, hi. <laughs> and there's a mic right there. It's a very lovely shirt dress as well. Very. Oh, that's, thank you. That's, that's <laughs> uh, I don't know how this works. Uh, all right. So my friend over here she actually works with sport and uh, gendered sport differences and everything and feminism deals with the uh, pay gap pay gap is a huge thing in feminism and in one of her works I've noticed that in football basketball as well but football especially the graph looks like this male salaries per hour and female so it's a over 300 percent difference in the salaries and one of the main questions that she's currently working on is how do you think the world is going to overcome it like through time? How do you think, will this, will this level and how will it level? Great question. The gap, I mean, the pay the gap is ridiculous. I mean, even honestly, during the pandemic, even just seeing how much these male footballers were earning when there weren't even matches to me was just like, like pay the doctors and stuff. But how do you deal with that? I mean, you say you don't receive much support anyway. How can we solve this pay gap? Yeah. Uh, I do agree that there is a big gap between men and women in the sports, uh, and a lot of people are working in equality. Uh, and I make sure that they understand what equality means. It's about equality, uh, the opportunity between them. So if you give a man a job with this, and this job as a coach, for example, my job as a, as a coach, uh, if I were a male, I will get 10 times more, <laughs> okay? So this is what I think it's very important. The equality and opportunity between female and male, especially in sport. And why, they do, why there is no equality? Because they uh, deal with the male game as a professional game. Female game, it's uh, just an opportunity, opportunity for girls to play. It's not. It's opportunity to play and to compete. And if she, for example, if we go back to US, they got World Cup many times. And the male team, the male team, they never got the, the, the World Cup, for example. So they did something different and they asked for the equality, but still there is no equality because there is no belief. So this is very important to change, to understand the definition of equality, because everyone's going out and asking for equality. They really need to know what equality means. And second thing is, when you ask for equality, you make sure that you're doing a good, uh, like for US, as, a, as I mentioned, they're really achieving a good uh, uh, result, uh, award. So when they ask for equality, I think they're right to ask for equality because they are a champion and they proved their serve and they proved that women can do things. So we really need to work on this. Uh, and I think a big organization are trying their best, putting a lot of effort in this. FIFA, uh, re regional wise here, AFC, and uh, one of the good uh, news uh, in football that we heard this year that uh, regarding the club uh, licensing, in the pro league in UAE, all the teams should have a woman team. Otherwise, they cannot play in a pro league for men. So now, these rules will support women to, uh, to be part of an official team. Al Nasr, Al Wahda, Banyas, they, they are top teams, top clubs. So they suppose. Uh, they're supposed to work in a female team. And I think a lot of organizations put a big effort in this. But it's all about different culture, different people, uh, perception. Uh, like, they need to really change their belief. And there is a lot of effort we need to put to change their belief and support. 
what needs to actually come first? Because obviously one of the arguments they make for men's football is, well, they, they, they're on TV, we get the big sponsors, there's a lot of sponsorship, blah, 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 ticket sales, all of this. Um, do you find media, um, do, like as in broadcast, they don't give women's football enough of a chance? Or is it because they see, well, we don't have advertisers who want to advertise, so why should we? It's Because it's, at the same time, they need to make money to keep running. Yes. Do they get, do they get money or make money uh, behind the women uh, sports? Mm. So this is the main target for media. Yeah. So they gonna support when there is games, people watching, people are ready to buy tickets and come to the games, a lot of things. Mm. That's why we are not getting enough of uh, sponsorship and media support because there is no games, there is no such good tournaments, good level of uh, tournaments and support. Mm. There is a lot of things we need to uh, work in the strategy of sports in, in, uh, internally and then big role of media will make change, definitely. And you're going to change things anyway. When are we going <laughs> to the World Cup? <laughs> You said you said Asian Cup that you're aiming for first, is that correct? Yeah, I said, uh, we have a different level of uh, championship. Yeah. Uh, first it's uh, Asian Cup, then it will take the uh, World Cup. And I think in future, if uh, we really get the support and all the clubs started doing a women's football, it really will change their career and pathway. Yeah. Questions? Hi. Hello, Mike's over there. I think we have time for one more, so. Um, so I currently work for the government and I'm developing the Sports Science Academy program, which um, we have lots of boys who are really interested in, in it and they always kind of want to sign up and they want to come on board. But I've been trying to champion it for the girls as well to try and get more girls. And the academy is running in lots of different schools across the UAE. The problem we have with recruitment is that girls are not sure that they can get a career in sport and the parents are also more concerned with their academic career. So what would your message be to the parents and to those girls to, to let them join the academy? Kind of what message would you give them? I think it's, it's uh, the, uh, the government need to make the change, not the parents because it's, it's the right decision. There is no opportunity. So definitely, they're gonna be uh, uh, thinking about the career of the kids. But government need to, uh, to, to really work in the opportunity and sports for female and in different positions. Even in my situation, when I started doing coaching, there was no opportunity. But r r now, the, the coaching, they opened an even men's club. So my license makes me coach even in male teams. And they need to feel the secure. The girls need to have secure. So they need to have more opportunity uh, uh, in, different, in different areas. And I think even the university need to have a very good, uh, academic wise, they need to have a support in a different areas for, in sports. Because for example, now uh, when you go to, to study PE, for example, we have only one university in UAE for female. They just uh, opened last year or two years ago. That's why we cannot see a lot of girls doing it to sports. And this, this is one way to, 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 to support female and uh, make them uh, go uh, take this pathway. Because she's an athlete and when she ends up going to the university, she needs to change her career, for example. And then she stopped because she said, oh, I cannot play now because I'm busy with the university and I can, there is no sport in university and there is nothing to study in sport the whole idea will be changed. So I think it's a different areas. They need to work together, government, parents, schools, uh, universities, and make opportunity and secure for others to, to, to join the programs. Awesome, thank you. Now guys, an hour is not enough. There's so much more I'd love to know from both of you. Um, and hopefully we've provided a bit of a, you know, kind of a snapshot into these two kind of emerging, emerging industries, I guess, you know. Um, just very quickly, 2021, what's next? Do you have uh, a goal for this year or just kind of like? I never, I, I, I had a discussion with Kiera here. 
she asked me once in the uh, I think we had a virtual uh, meeting yeah. and she asked me that question and I said I never thought what's next I just keep doing things and the doors opens طب الحمد لله And how does that apart from making your first million with Modestish? Was <laughs> yeah, really, I'm just focusing on Modestish, building that up as kind of the a global leading destination for, for modest fashion and continuing to destigmatize modest fashion through that. Awesome. More females like you guys, please. So this brings us to the end of the session. And just to give you a quick reminder, so Modesty, a fashion paradox is by Hafsa Lodi. And then we've got Becoming a Legend by Huri Al-Tahiri. Uh, this brings us to the end of the session. Um, but before you head off to the festival bookshop, get these books. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us uh, at the Emirates Airline Festival Literature this weekend. Now, I know it's it's you know a bit of a challenging time and whatnot, but to see you all coming out and supporting, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank the AV team and the volunteers who tirelessly sanitize the mics every time somebody comes near them because your safety comes first. Um, also, I'd like to thank Thank our title sponsor, Emirates Airline, our founding partner, Dubai Culture, our venue partner, Al Sirkal Avenue, the festival's parent organization, Emirates Literature Foundation, and last but not least, our wonderful guests, Hafsa Lodi and Hori Al Tahiri. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You.